It's uh, what we have labeled as uh, Heritage Sunday because it was 25 years ago that unity became a reality. Uh, we had a lot of things leading up to the time we actually became a church. And we're here today to celebrate that and to relive some of the things we did in our early days. And you're going to find as we go throughout the service, not much has changed. We changed the name and changed a few affirmations here and there, but it's, it's pretty much the same. So uh, through our uh, presentations and through the music, we'll kind of uh, unfold the history of our first 10, 12, 13 years together as uh, what started out to be as Unity Church of St. Cloud or Unity Church of Central Minnesota, now Unity Spiritual Center, but it's all the same one big happy family. So let's open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, we thank you so much for bringing us here together today. We thank you for the beautiful weather outside, the sunshine. Uh, we thank you for the sunshine that we have within us. And we thank you especially for guiding us through 25 years. We are happy, we are excited, and I guess we could most appropriately end by saying thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Unity all started, Unity in St. Cloud all started in the mid 80s when Wayne Smith uh, wrote a letter to Unity South in St. Cloud. And I'm going to let Wayne tell you about that experience. In the fall of 1986, I was newly single and alone. And I decided I'd like to meet new friends that have studied metaphysical principles. Well, where can I find that? Well, Unity. I had been to Golden Valley at the Unity Church and heard and experienced that beautiful spiritual center. So I decided, hmm, I'm going to write a letter to the minister at Unity Golden Valley and see if there's a person who can come from there to teach us metaphysical principles through Unity Film or Artifacts. Sure enough, he writes back and he says, come to a church on Sunday afternoon, meet me in my office, I have someone for you to meet. So. Uh, it was maybe a month later that I, I go to the Unity area, and the night before, I had a dream. I never told you that then. I had a dream. <laughs> Early in the morning, I'm going to meet someone. She's an elderly woman, grandmother figure, an elder. So I kept that dream with me, and I meet Reverend Jim Fisher after the service. In walks Marcella London. Just a fireball. Just ready to go. Come to, come to St. Cloud and do the Unity Principle Studies week after week after week. And when I, when I saw her, then when she walked in, she was the elder, wise woman to bring her wisdom of the Unity Principles to St. Cloud. And that's how it started. And it was, that's how it started. And Denny, Denny and Jerry Gustafson and, and Sue and many, many, many other people here. We're part of that first group. As a matter of fact, uh, I, wanted, I put an ad in the paper in St. Cloud Times. Shortly thereafter, 15 people showed up at, at second floor of North Junior High School. Were you there then, then, then? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Marcella came in and, and she rescued us. She sat down. Whatever preconceived notions you have of spirituality, just kind of set them aside. We're going to really look at metaphysical principles that Charles Fulman brought to us. And here we are. I can't believe it. Here we are today. Blessings of everybody. Marcella, one, one good antidote. Marcella, how are you, dear? If I was anybody, you couldn't even stand me. <laughs> she believed in herself so well, so deeply, that it just shined out of her. So we remember her in prayer and God are so grateful that Wayne took the initiative to write that first letter. And he talked about Marcella being this grandmotherly type. We knew she was somewhere between 55 and 80. We had no <laughs> idea. And all the time she was with us, she, she really never aged. So anyway, um, I saw after Wayne put the end paper, they did a feature story of this unity group meeting at North Junior High, which was just a couple of blocks from, you know, from my home, and I was looking. I went to my priest, and I said, Father, I'm really struggling with the divinity of Jesus. I don't know what to do. He gave the most 
wonderful, wonderful little pep talk. He didn't say, oh, you got to believe, you know, you, you don't just totally, totally understand me. He said, the fact that you are struggling is a sign of faith. And I thought that was really, really neat. So anyway, I see this ad in the paper. I, I was looking for something. I see this article in the paper about this unity group meeting at North Junior High, two blocks away from home. So I walked down there, and I was listening in, and I thought, holy buckets, this is good stuff. This is what I'm looking for. So after I walked into the room and said, uh, you know, can anybody join the group? And of course, unity is so new. It's like, well, of course, it's any time. So that was the beginning. And we had classes for two, oh, two to three years or so. And then the group kind of disbanded. Uh, and a couple of years later, it had to be in the early 90s somewhere. And Rob was down in Minneapolis. And I didn't want to make sales calls. So I found this old list of phone numbers, and there was Marcella's number on that list. And I said, I'm going to give Marcella a call. So I called her up and I said, Marcella, what are you up to? She said, oh, I've been ordained a unity minister. And she said, I said, well, how would you like to come to St. Cloud and start a church? She said, I would love to come to St. Cloud and start a church. So we had a bunch of meetings. I know Jerry was there. Who was at the first meeting without that Happy Chef? It was then, Dennis Mearing's Cafe. I know Jerry was there, Rich was there. But anyway, we just kind of talked about this and started a little steering committee. And uh, uh, it, it, we decided that we wanted to eventually become a church. So we started out again as a study group. And there was one point in there where some of the people really, really wanted to study some other things. And there was one thing about Marcella. There was one cornerstone of everything that she did in her ministry and everything she taught us who followed her. This is unity. This is unity. You can have lots of different things, but this is unity. So anyway, um, at one point, some of the folks weren't real happy with the study group. So we were going to have a meeting without Marcella. And I was going to be there and then kind of take the, be the go-between between between the group and Marcella. And uh, so we met and they said, well, let's just be a well-oiled study group. You know, we don't have to be a church, let's be a study group. And I went to Marcella and we met just, we were at the Americana Inn at the time. We had a meeting room there. And I told Marcella that was what the group had said. And Marcella had the typical Marcella response. Yeah, that's fine with me. I mean, she absolutely, yeah. Every, I mean, everything was in divine order. So anyway, we were sitting around our table studying. We had a class going. And Marcella said, I'm going to do the, uh, the lesson on, this was the Sunday before Thanksgiving. She said, I'm going to do the lesson at Unity South. Can I practice on you? We said, well, sure. So she was sitting at the end of the table starting to give the lesson. And they had a podium and chair set up. And I said, Marcella, why don't you go up there and be behind the podium? We'll sit in the, in the seats so it'll be more like church that way. So she did that, gave the lesson. We got back. We finished the lesson. And we said, hey, folks, let's revisit this. Let's revisit this. We had opening prayer. We had a lesson. We had meditation. The only thing we didn't have was music. We, for practical purposes, had a service. We're closer to being a church than we think we are. How about next week we have our first service? And we said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so we said, well, we don't have music. So I went out shopping to find some music because all we had was a cassette player. CDs weren't around yet. <laughs> and I found this song, How Great Thou Art by the Statler Brothers. Okay? That's all we had. But it worked. That was our first song ever. How Great Thou Art by the Statler Brothers. And at all of our significant anniversaries and everything, we always sang that in honor of our beginning. Sing, everybody sing along. Yeah. 
so uh, anyway, uh, there we were. And Marcella came up every Sunday for service. And many times she uh, would come up during the week because she would do a class for eight, ten weeks at a time. And we paid her a whopping $500 a month. And we got this mysterious anonymous gift of $500 a month from somebody. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing I know where it came from. So uh, we always opened our service with an affirmation. And you can see that our opening affirmation then isn't too different from what it is now. You know, we've grown, we've changed, but we've also stayed uh, pretty much anchored in the same stuff. So I will say it once and then you can repeat it after me. Unity Church of St. Cloud area is an expanding center of Christ's light, mighty to attract its good and radiate good to others. Together, Unity, Unity Church of St. Cloud area is an expanding center of Christ's light, mighty to attract its good and radiate good to others. Um, we had quite a journey. Um, we were here, we were there, we were everywhere. <laughs> we kind of likened ourselves to Moses in the desert. Every time we would find something, something would happen, you know, the, the place we were running would, uh, well, Sue can tell you that story. But instrumental, instrumental in us ending up here today. Well, I'm going to explain more about the story afterwards. But Sue has prepared kind of a pictorial of where we have been, and we have most of our locations are there. Okay, Sue will hear it. Okay. We'll get rid of that. <laughs> Next slide, which is, I'm, I'm just going to do a, a brief. Um, there, there's, I got pictures of the places that we've been. And like Danny said, cassette tapes were our friends okay. back then. And maybe, you know, now, I think everyone here is old enough to remember cassette tapes, but that's my <laughs> recollection. But unlike the rest of these guys, unlike our, our wonderful Danny and, and Wayne, I have just bits and fragments of recollections of being with the study groups from the beginning, but um, but I don't have a, you know, my, my recollection is kind of spotty. So one of the things I did was call people, and I, I called um, Pat and Dale and said, what were the dates we were doing these things, you know, because it wasn't, there wasn't, our, our history is kind of checkered in terms of what we have for documentation. And so I relied on memories. So this is this is close. This may you may look at these and go, I'm not sure it was quite that year, but this is close <laughs> as it's going to get. So we were we were at the Saint Paul Public Library um, as one of our first places where we met, um, and and that was where the old library was, not where the current one is. And then we went to um, then we were at the Americana Inn with our first services. But before that, we were, so the first official service was there with Marcella Lundgren, um, and that was a picture of her. Then we were at um, North Junior High in those, in approximately those dates, 94 to 98, and Marcella was there <laughs> with us. Then we went to a little house on Riverside Drive, Northeast, which is um, in St. Cloud. Uh, we were there for um, just a year, or, you know, it was just a year or two. But when, one year, <laughs> one flood, one flood, one flood in the basement. Okay. Must have been our house. Um, and there's, here's a picture of Marcella again with Denny in 99. Then we went to, uh, we rented space from Peace United Lutheran Church, uh, sorry, Peace United Church of Christ in St. Cloud, which is the, um, which is the church that um, Bob and Jerry were part of. Um, that was, from 99 to about 2000. Our minister at the time was Ron Pitson. Don't have a picture of him, unfortunately. Um, then we went to Midtown Square. And um, we were in a storefront there. I mean, it was not, it was really not my favorite place. <laughs> we had to set up chairs every Sunday and take everything down and store everything. And it was kind of a lot of work. But um, Debbie tells me that we were there a couple of times, that we went there and then we you know, then did we go back to peace? I don't know. But um, anyway, it was um, Midtown Square. Then we went to the New Traditions Theater, which is right across the street from Paramount. That was um, a black box theater where the great theater company put on productions. Well, we were there. Um, that it's currently the Central Cafe. It was Central Kirk's Coffee Place downtown. Um, and then uh, we were 
joined by Reverend Liz Pettiprin. Um, she was with us from 2001 to 2004. Then we went to the, the Hatling Flint building, which was on the intersection of Highway 23 and Highway 10 Southeast. So we were in this building. How many of you remember being in the Hatling Flint, Flint building? Yeah, okay. Um, and there again, we were there from 2004 to 2006 where Evan Liz was with us. And here was a, here's a picture of Evan Liz with Jerry and Danny. They don't age, do they? Oh, no. Honest to goodness. <laughs> and then um, we, we were in the, the little church that was, um, Denny was the volunteer um, church coordinator. Um, and it was at this um, little church at Lake, at Lake George that we, we purchased the property, we were on a contract for deed, and we were there from 2006 to 2011. So five years. During that time, Denny was our spiritual leader <coughs> volunteer um, coordinator. Um, and, and then um, we got, uh, we had the, the pleasure of getting a Reverend Barbara Winter Martin in 2007. She was with us, as you know, until um, last year at this time. And then we moved to where we are today. And that's been our, like Dennis says, the, 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 the process of Moses in the desert, it feels like. <laughs> and here we are today. This is just such a wonderful place. And and it has a place, dear place in my heart, too, as well, because we were part of members when it was a celebration here. Mike and I were married. We were right here. Oh. So, um, yeah. So that's our journey. There's and three more slides. Our candlelight uh, service, we're still going to continue, um, Mike tells, uh, tells me, and then we we had um, Reverend Bain for six months, and now we have our wonderful Mike Sharp. And one of the songs we used to affirm that was the Little Brown Church in the Vale. We were dreaming of having our Little Brown Church, and our goal was to have it near the birthplace of Charles Fillmore. So, you know, as we went through our ups and downs, uh, we were at Hatley and Flint, and Lynn and Scott Rice joined us. They both since, uh, since made their transition, but they were members of Christian Science. They only had about six members left. And they were out at Hatley and Flint, and, you know, because they were looking something, they, they, they were looking for the teaching that, that we had. And um, uh, so Scott said something about, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to sell our church. And Alan, who was our president at the time, said, did you say sell? <laughs> and so we started to negotiate with them. <laughs> so, so we started to negotiate with them, and we ended up buying it. And then we had to revamp because we couldn't get out of our lease at Hatling and Flint. So we made, Alan and I made many trips to Princeton trying to negotiate new terms with them. And in the old days, the seventh commandment used to be thou shalt not steal. Um, <laughs> what we negotiated with them was close to breaking that. They, they wanted us to have it, they really did. So we had it, we left, it took us about three or four months to get out of our lease, which we had to do where we couldn't, you know, say at, at our, our church down there late. So anyway, during all of this, from early on, when Marcella was still her, here, um, our goal was to have church on near the birthplace of Charles Fillmore. And Sue and others, Sue was mainly instrumental in that, researched and researched and researched, and as near as they could find, uh, the uh, Charles Fillmore's birthplace is over by Heinz Mill, you know, where the two rivers come together. And our goal was to have a little brown church in Vail near the birthplace of Charles Fillmore. Well, our church isn't little. <laughs> and it is not in the Vail. <laughs> but it is brown. <laughs> and it is very within three miles of Charles Fillmore's birthplace. This was always our affirmation song of our prosperity and ending up in just the right place.
much. I mean, we've, we've had so much fun with the music and, and, and what it's meant to us, you know, individually and as a congregation. And uh, I think this is an appropriate time to talk about some of the other people that were involved. You've met Sue. Uh, Alan was our president from the Hatling and Flint in our first two years at the new church. And Alan and Chuck, Chuck where are you, our current president, now they have something in common. <laughs> we said, Alan, why don't you be on the board? He said, okay, I'll be on the board. <laughs> they came to the first meeting and all of a sudden they were president. That's <laughs> 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 true. Yeah, 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 it's true, it's true. And Alan said, I've never been president. And Jerry said, don't worry, I'll help you. And, and Jerry, by the way, was kind of our rock of Gibraltar as far as keeping us in line and tune, making sure that we were doing things uh, in the right way. And through that, she gained the, uh, it's from Linda Pat, who used to be a treasurer, she gained the nickname Mother Church. <laughs> and we enjoyed that. But others that were there early, um, Mike and Ann and Carly, who are on our music team, um, Pat and Dale, and you'll meet Dale here in a minute, uh, Jerry, uh, we had some board members. April, you were board member. Marlene, board members. Anybody involved? Curly Monsignor. Where's Monsignor? Um, uh, these these people were involved early in the board. And, thank you. And you know, and we, we we went through our ups and downs, folks. I mean, you, you always do. And these folks were so stable and, and so positive, and we just stayed the course. Uh, and and I, I thank all of you, uh, you know, so much for what you did. So now it is time for our daily word. And Dale has been so active in the church in a number of ways. He's done services. He's done wonderful, wonderful lessons. He's done daily word. He's done meditation. And uh, he always makes sure that Pat gets here for choir rehearsal as well. So Dale Winchlander with our daily word. Love it. Um, I remember that one of the things that we used to do was Marcella would ask us to stand up and she would testify just briefly about what brings us to you, why are we here today. And my answer was always the same. And it was uh, based on the fact that we had sons that were five natures old and we wanted them to grow up with the message that they were loved unconditionally. And that of course is because <laughs> we needed that ourselves. And this was a place where we got that week after week from the people that came to me. And uh, I noticed when it came up here today, the daily word love. So I was struggling with how to reconcile with what the daily word for today really is. It's not love. <laughs> <laughs> it's something else. But I quickly skip through here, and next Sunday it's love. Uh -oh. So we're flashing forward. Next Sunday, whoever's doing the daily word can go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because love is what it is all about for us, for us. It's where we find unconditional love, no judgments. And so, I am divine love in expression. I am a creative, spiritual being, and the substance with which I create is divine love. This includes the loving feelings I may experience as my day unfolds. These are important elements. But divine love exists deeply in feelings, at the very core of my being. The Trappist monk and author, Thomas Merton, described love as an intensification of life. My life today is deepened and strengthened by the creative intensity I bring to every choice. It is only by allowing the substance of love to shape my day that I can intensify my life experience and be a blessing to others. I am divine love and expression. And my heart is open to every opportunity the day will bring to share that love with others. In Colossians it says, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony.
Jeremy is going to lead us in guided meditation. Close your eyes and relax in one of those soothing voices. Be still and know it is not ourselves, but the Christ within that heals, that blesses, that forgives, that protects, and that provides. As we enter into silent prayer during this lovely Christmas season, let us call to mind the night long, the night when Jesus was born. Close your eyes now, become still, and allow that night to be a symbol of the silent place within your own heart and mind. And in this stillness, this presence of God is born anew within each of us as we pray silently. Dear God, in this golden moment, I am fully aware that you are the very life within every cell of my body. I know you are with me always and always. In that region, there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock. During those still moments, we could feel the cool, crisp air Laid across the hills, and the shepherds were on duty, watching the sheep. Under their watchful eye, their each lavished shirt of safety and protection. And we too are protected, protected by God's love within. Our awareness of this love assures us of our personal well-being, and the well-being of all those we care for. With this assurance comes a deep sense of peace, a heavenly peace, as we rest in the love of God in the silence. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in cloths and laid him in manger. The love of God is life itself, and this love is within you, within me, within everyone, as strength, as health, as vitality, as life. Through God's love, we move and have our being. We allow ourselves to experience the love of God as it moves through us now, healing us, strengthening us. And during these times of war, moments of prayer. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came seeking a child. Where is that child who was born long ago? For we observed his star and have come to pay him homage. Just as the wise men were guided by the star long ago, we too are guided by the star, by the light. Our guidance is God's sweet love, more brilliant than any star, and it shines within us to show us our new wisdom, our new understanding, our new goodwill, our continuing hope. We open our minds and hearts to the love of God and allow ourselves to express that love in everything we say, everything we think, everything we do. This precious love leads us and guides us to rest together silence prayer. 
The birth of Jesus, the sacred gift to the world, is symbolic of the gift of God's love within every heart. In this love is all we could ever want, all we might ever need, and through it, we are blessed with friendships, opportunities, ideas, and abundance. As we consider the magnificent gifts and the blessings, we know we are God's child. Thank you, God, for the gift of your love, which is our health, our abundance, our wisdom, and our peace. As we prepare to return to the present time, to this present place, we do so with an awareness of God's love and the meaning of the Christmas season, knowing that all is well. Thank you. Because I did, I did struggle with some of the teachings that I had in my upbringing. And that's okay. That's okay. We have 8 billion people on this planet, and no two of us are going to think or act or worship in the same way. So for whatever path people are on, Reverend Barbara Soul stressed that with us, the path you are on right now will never be questioned when you come to you. Uh, I think it, it was either Eric Butterworth or James Yellow Freeman, two of our most wonderful, wonderful authors, as, as he talked about unity, said, unity isn't a religion about Jesus. Unity teaches the religion of Jesus. And so I began to reframe all of this stuff, and I said, hey, this really makes sense. What he taught really makes sense. And so the, the 13 words that start unity were from Myrtle Fillmore, who was diagnosed with tuberculosis, which in those days was terminal. And uh, she went to hear a speaker one night, and the speaker said, you are a child of God, and therefore you do not inherit sickness. And she went back home and told Charles, her husband, um, about that. And they were new thought. They were searching new thought all over the country. They go to all these meetings and all this stuff about new thought. And Charles Fillmore, one of our, our co-founder, used to have great advice. He said, if you are struggling with something, if there's something that you don't understand, take it to headquarters. And that was his way of saying, get quiet, meditate, and let it come to you. And as you know, meditation and prayer is a, is a big part of what we do at Unity. It allows you a chance to, to get quiet. And, you know, Marcella grounded us so well in Unity Principles. I mean, there are five Unity Principles, and she just really, really grounded us in studying those principles. And as you see stuff, you know, you'll be looking at a daily word or, or, or whatever, or reading a book or whatever, and you see something, and you say, oh, man, that's really good. Well, I don't like that over here. What do you do? Take what's good. Let the rest go. Your spiritual journey is exactly that. It is your spiritual journey. It's yours. It's all yours. And, you know, there's, there's so much. Well, I, I, always, I always say this. The person that really understands God 
is the one that says, I don't have a clue. <laughs> we have all kinds of people pontificating. You have to learn this. You have to do You have to think this way. You have to think this way. One thing that I've never heard from any of these speakers is, is, and I never used it when I was the, the coordinator for those two years, uh, never said, unity believes. Because unity isn't based on doctrine. We might say unity teaches. Well, this author taught this, this author taught that. And when you hear that, you say, yeah, that makes sense to me. Or no, that doesn't make sense to me. Hey, this is a free country, folks. You get, you get to develop your own, your own spirituality. So as I look at the first two principles, the first one is God is everywhere present and absolute good. I don't understand it, but I know it's there. I know it's there. Uh, and then the second principle is human beings uh, have a spark of divinity within them. And the affirmation says the Christ spirit within. Uh, they are, their very essence is of God. Therefore, they are inherently good. And when you see the word Christ spirit, now this doesn't mean Jesus is a man. This means your divinity. And Jesus taught that so much. In fact, the Gospel of St. Thomas, which never made the cut, but Thomas taught, you know, because we all, everybody's talking about Jesus being divine. Jesus being divine. Was Jesus divine? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like you. We are all this part of divinity. And in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus taught that. That, yeah, I, I'm divine. See, Jesus didn't come here to teach you his divinity. He came to introduce you to your divinity, this wonderful spark, whatever it is. And it brings to mind, we study a book for about four weeks. Uh, it's called Codename God by Man Muhammad. He was, among other things, he came to America with, with three bucks in his pocket and became a multi-multi-millionaire. Uh, he was a quantum physicist. And the book Codename God is really, really intriguing. First, he talks about his life and what brought him to America. Uh, you know, he was in India where he could never rise above a certain, a certain level. Even though he's a brilliant scholar, his, um, his professor invited him to dinner. And when it came time to dinner, he had to sit out in the kitchen because he wasn't in that cast or case, whatever you call it, you know. Uh, so anyway, he came here. And one of the most profound things that he said he said, here I was in this beautiful mansion, million, multi-million dollar mansion. He dated one of the Gaboras, I think, Ava or uh, the other, or his sister. One of, he dated them, it didn't last a long time, but, but he, he dated her. And he said, I was standing out on my, on my front porch, and I looked, there was an island out there, and the birds were flying, and it was beautiful, and the ocean was colored, and the sun was shining, and... His conclusion was this, that same force, whatever you want to call it, that same force is flowing through me. And that's what the second principle says. You have divinity flowing within you. You are a divine creature. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. So let's do a little experiment here. Say to yourself, I am, don't do it. I am going to move my arm. I am going to move my arm. Now, everybody, move your arm. Okay. Now, we know where the command center is in the brain. We know the part of the brain, we've identified the part of the brain that sent the message from the brain to the muscle to move. We have never found the commander of the command center. That is your higher self, your uh, higher awareness, your one with, with God, whatever you want to call it. I don't understand a thing about it, but I know it exists. I don't understand anything about electricity, but I can turn a light on and, and you know, light works. We don't have to understand it. Just use it. Oh, and, and, and Eric Butterworth and, and some of our authors just said that. You don't have to understand that. Just know it's there. That peace, that serenity, that divinity. That wonderfulness is your very essence. Your very essence is of God. 
So think about that as you're in your quiet time. And you know, I, I, I struggle with meditation and my mind goes all over the place and I'm trying to get better and better and better and better. By the way, I think it was Buddha said, if you don't have time to uh, meditate a half hour a day, you need to meditate an hour a day. <laughs> it is so important. And that's one of the essence of unity teaching is take that quiet time, you know, make your connection with whatever you want to call it. Uh, Manny Bahana decided, well, it's this thing out there, you can call it anything you want, might as well call it God. And he went through all the quantum physics stuff too to prove this. And I never understood that, so I asked Mike, you know, but um, anyway, uh, it's, it's there and it's real. So try to tap into that. Find that inner peace every day. And I've been struggling with that, and I've used, um, I've, I've used that second affirmation, or the second principle a lot in my affirmation. I've used, I am one with the Father, I am one with God, I am one with the universe, I'm, you know, all of that, just to try to get all of the other thoughts out of your mind. And as you know, you're sitting there, pretty soon, oh, let's see, five o'clock, yeah, I gotta get home. <laughs> oh, God, I, I got a meeting today. Oh, I sure got this done. <sighs> Be still. And know that I'm God. And I knew Jerry was going to start a meditation with that. Be still. Be still. And know that I'm God. Here's something that worked for me. I go to a great massage therapist. And um, his, his company is Tranquil Heart. And I have found myself in the morning, or many times during the day, I have a Tranquil Heart. What do you mean? You're late for the meeting. Yeah, but you know what that person said the other day. Yeah, I, I know that. But inside, wherever it is, I have that tranquil heart. And you can use that many, many, many times. I'm running like, oh, that, that, that light is red. Oh, I'm, I'm. I have a tranquil heart. Or I have divinity within me. My very essence is a and you use all of the, the, the power that you were endowed with as a human being to just live life. And it's going to go through its ups and downs, folks. It always is. But to as much as you can, prepare yourself to the fact, when I run into turmoil today, I know, I know I have this tranquil heart. And it's wonderful. And I can respond with and with love, our bumper stickers stay so nice, they don't they? Respond with love. It's all within you. So today, oh, and, and one more thing, you use this, the second, second uh, principle of wonderful affirmation. Because you know, human beings have a spark of divinity within them, right? Yeah. I have a spark of divinity within me. That's not arrogance. It just plain is. I have a spark of divinity. My very essence is of God. Therefore, I'm inherently good. And then the little voice pops, yeah, but you heard what you said. No, 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 that was yesterday. I am inherently good. If I can find that inner peace, I am inherently good. And your family, your family, my wife, you know, what, what you know, in 50 years, you know, it's up and down and you want to keep growing. <laughs> and so that has really helped me, and she didn't come with hair and come black. I'll just tell my stories, but anyway, <laughs> I, I, you know, I looked at her and I said, man, there's a divine, divine creature to have be my wife. But this divinity, this wonderfulness, this whatever you want to call it, divine love, divine essence, is flowing through her. Oh, and I'll tell you, it, 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 it just... It reframes so many things. The people that you like, yeah, they have divinity flowing through them. Their very essence is of God. Here's a tough one. The people that we don't like, they still have divinity and this divine essence flowing through them. And eventually you can look upon the things that really bug the heck out of you. And you, you might not like them, you might not ever invite them out to dinner. But you can begin to reframe how you're looking at that other 
divine creature that we call a human being. So uh, I, I guess I leave you with this thought, and it's what we've, uh, you know, we based the whole thing on, is to use that unity principle, number two. First of all, number one is God is everywhere present, absolute good, flowing through you, through everybody, flowing through the trees, flowing through the birds, flowing through everything. But then you have a spark of divinity within you. Your very essence is of God. You are also, because of that, inherently good. And so.